Thank you, Pastor. It's always good to be back at Fairhaven. Let me ask this question. How many here have never heard me speak before? Would you raise your hand? You've never heard me speak before. Well, that's quite a few of you. I'm glad because uh, I want to give you my testimony. And the others are sick of hearing it, I know, but I like giving my testimony. I was brought up in, in Sturgis, Michigan, so that's not all that far from here, but I was brought up in a home of drinking and cursing. The only time I heard the name Jesus growing up was as a curse word. Uh, my dad was an electrician, worked at Kirsch Factory in Sturgis, Michigan. My mom also worked on the line at the Kirsch Factory. Uh, they'd come home and run off to the uh, Eagles or the Moose or the VFW or one of those places for drinking and then to the bowling alley. And they'd come home quite often after too much drink, arguing and carrying on. We didn't have anything to do with God, didn't know anything about God. Now, I believed in a God. I believed that there was a God. I believed that he was real, but I didn't have a clue who he was. After all, we didn't go to church or have anything to do with God. I was a rock and roll disc jockey for a while up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Then I went into country western music. And while I was working at the country western radio station, another announcer asked me if I'd like to play softball with his church team. Now, I'm a sports nut, man. If you can throw it, kick it hit it, do whatever with it. I like doing it. So I said, sure, I'll play. And he says, well, there is one catch. You have to go to church once a week in order to play. I said, I don't know about that, man. I'll uh, go home, talk to my wife, see what she thinks about it. We talked it over and thought it couldn't hurt us to go to church once a week. We'd slip in for Sunday school or the Sunday morning service. If we missed that, we might slip into the Sunday night service. But we never met, went more than one time a week. That was it. But it was the first time in my life I found out who Jesus was. I did not know he was the son of God. Now, if you'd have showed me a picture of Jesus that most everybody has seen, uh, I would have said, that's Jesus. If you'd have showed me a crucifix, I could have identified Jesus as being on the cross. Had no idea who he was or why he even came to earth. I didn't know that he came to die on the cross to pay for my sins, to be buried, to be raised three days later from the dead. But that preacher was faithful to preaching the word of God and telling us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I began to realize that this sinner wasn't going to heaven, but was going to hell. You see, I used to think that one day I'd die and I'd stand before God and he'd put all my good works on one side of a big scale and all my bad works on the other side of that scale. And I was such a good guy that the good would outweigh the bad and God would let me into heaven. But the preacher said, that's not the way it works. For we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. He told about Jesus dying on the cross to pay for my sins, that he was buried, rose three days later from the dead, that I could have eternal life by trusting Christ as Savior. In the fall of 1971, I was sitting at the radio station. I'd played four and a half hours of country music, and a preacher had a half-hour broadcast from 4.30 to 5 o'clock. So I sat there listening to that broadcast, waiting for the news to start at 5 o'clock, and I would be doing the newscast. He got to the end of the broadcast and he said, if you'd like to trust Christ as your Savior, you can do it right now, right where you're at. So there at WAOP radio station in Otsego, Michigan, just north of Kalamazoo, I bowed my head and asked Jesus Christ to save my soul. Thank God he did it, for he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, listen, I had no idea what God had in store for me. If you'd have said to me back then, you know, you're going to be a preacher. I thought, you got to be kidding, man. I'm glad I'm saved, glad I'm going to heaven, but never thought anything like that. But it's amazing how God changes your life, and he changes it completely. Short, shortly after I got saved, my wife got saved. We began growing in the Lord. We were expecting our first child when we got saved, and that, of course, is Kathy. And um, it, it's just, it's been a trip. And here I am now, 71 years of age, and I'm closer to heaven than I've ever been. And I can't wait to see Jesus and praise him in glory for all that he's done. If you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read about eight verses to get us started this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The scripture says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, Declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I want to preach this morning, if I'd only known. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I beg you again this morning for the filling of the Holy Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God would take your truth deep into every heart. For any here who've never come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, taking him as Savior, may this morning they see their need for the Son of God, convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Turn them to the Savior, I pray, and may they get that free gift of eternal life. Now, Lord, bless today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, I was reading from this passage, and I got to verse 8. And I read that again, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And I looked at that for a moment and thought about it. If they'd known something, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. So I decided, what was it that they didn't know? And I read back to verse 7. It said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So what he's saying here is then, if the princes of this world had known the wisdom of God, they would not have crucified Jesus. Well, that led me to ask the question, why didn't they know? I mean, after all, they had the wisdom of man. But the wisdom of man is so ignorant of the wisdom of God. For instance, the wisdom of man saw that he was born in a stable and saw not that he was the king of the palaces in heaven. The wisdom of man saw that he was so poor that he had no place to lay his head and didn't realize that he owned the cattle on a thousand hills. The wisdom of man saw that he had no armies on earth to follow him but could not see that he had 12 legions of angels looking over the parapet of heaven and anxious for any call from him at all. The wisdom of man saw him take the robe of a servant and wash the disciples' feet and didn't see that his slightest wish was the greatest command of the angels of glory. You see, the wisdom of man sees only the shame and the disgrace of the cross. But the wisdom of God sees beyond that to the glorified Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father. The wisdom of God sees beyond the cross to the pearly white city and that spotless bride, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, on display. The wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. What a difference. The wisdom of man sees him nailed to a cross, defeated. But the wisdom of God sees him dying for you to have life. The wisdom of man sees his blood flowing to end his life. But the wisdom of God sees his blood flowing to give us life. The wisdom of man sees his body slumped in death. But the wisdom of God sees our sin debt fully paid. The wisdom of man sees him buried. But the wisdom of God sees him rising from the dead three days later. The Jews wanted the Christ to reign from Jerusalem and to free them from the bondage of Rome. And they didn't, need, they didn't realize that, first of all, they needed him to die on the cross to free them from the bondage of sin. What a difference between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. For had there been no cross, there could be no grace. Had there been no shame, there could be no glory. Had there been no agony, there could be no joy. Had there been no death, there could be no life. Had there been no wounds, there could be no healings. Had there been no jeerings, there could be no hallelujahs. Well, had they only known. But the next question is, why didn't they know? I mean, after all, they had the word of God. The wise men from the east, they knew. After all, they had the book of Numbers. It spoke of his star that would come. They had the book of Daniel. It told that when the Christ would be born. The Jews had that in Jerusalem, but none of them were looking for Jesus at that time. These wise men come from the east, and they ask the question, where is he that's born king of the Jews? 
And those Jews had to go back and read their Bible for a while until they found Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And they saw that he was to be born in Bethlehem. You would have thought all of them would have went with the wise men to see him, but they didn't. Those wise men, and they truly were wise, seeking for this one born king of the Jews. And they went to see Jesus. So the wise men knew of his birth. Simeon and Anna, who were at the temple when Mary brought the baby Jesus to the temple, they knew that this was the Son of God. Even later, when Jesus was about to begin his ministry, John the Baptist saw him coming and said publicly, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You'll remember even Jesus' own disciples, two of them on the day of the resurrection, were walking from Jerusalem to the city of Emmaus. They had heard it told that Jesus' grave was empty, but they hadn't yet believed that he had risen from the dead. So Jesus appeared to those two disciples. They were downcast. Jesus, whom they did not recognize, wondered why they were so downcast. And they said, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Jesus took them and rebuked them. In John, Luke chapter 24 and verse 25, he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. The reality of it is they did not know because they refused to know. They did not know because they rejected the wisdom of God and said yes to the wisdom of men. But before we condemn them too harshly, multitudes do exactly the same thing today. They accept the wisdom of man over the wisdom of God. And all they'll be able to say later on is if I'd only known. As I meditated upon this, I thought of three groups of people who cry out, if I only known. That first group, quite obviously, are those in hell, burning in hell for all eternity. And I wonder how many people in hell are crying out, if I'd only known that hell would be like this, I would have gotten saved. You know, there are a lot of people that think that hell is on this earth, and that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Because you can at least take a drug that'll put you out for a little while. There are no drugs to put you out in the pain. In hell. There, at least here, you can get a drink of water to cool your tongue. There's no drink of water or anything else to cool your tongue in hell. Think about it torment continuously, no end, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never ends, always conscious, never able to sleep one bit. And besides that, think of how dumb it is to live in a hell on earth only to die and go to the real hell. You realize that nobody spoke more about hell than did Jesus in the Bible? Jesus is the one who told the story about the rich man and the beggar. It says, and it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. He lift up his eyes being in torment and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham reminded him that nobody could get to him to give him a drink of water and that nobody in hell could get out. Once you're there, you're there for good. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 46, seven times he talks about hell, fire. Three times he says, Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, why would the Lord Jesus Christ speak so much about hell? Because he doesn't want you to go there. He's warning you. He offers you an escape. You can come to Christ today and have eternal life.
but you die without Christ. And hell is all that awaits for the rest of eternity. Well, I've heard people say, but preacher, I want to enjoy my sin. I like my booze. I like my drugs. I want to be with my friends. Some of you will remember the name Evil Knievel. Many years ago, of course, he's been dead now for a number of years, but many years ago, he was going to jump the Snake River Canyon in his rocket-propelled motorcycle. Of course, there was a big hullabaloo about that, and of course, hullabaloo, that's an Alabama word, I think. Don't ask me what it means, but I hear him use it all the time. But anyway, uh, the news media was there, and they said, what if you don't make it? Evil Knievel said, then I guess I'll be in hell drinking a beer waiting for my buddies. He was only partly right. He'd been in hell, but there'd been no beer to drink. And instead of waiting for his buddies, he'd be screaming for someone, someone to go and tell his buddies that they not come to that awful place called hell. Oh, how many in hell cry out, if I'd only known hell would be like this, I would have gotten saved. Once they're there, it's too late. I have no doubt there are some people in hell who cry out if I'd only known that salvation was in trusting Jesus and not in baptism, not in good works, not in the church, but in Jesus Christ alone, I would have gotten saved. But why didn't they know that? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible declares all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, There are people thinking they're going to get to heaven on filthy rags. You can't do it. You've got to come to Jesus. He's your only hope. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus made it plain. He said, I'm it. There's no other way. That means he is either the only way to heaven or he's no way at all. Because if he was a liar or a deceiver or deceived himself, then he could not be the savior of mankind. He would have died lost. But see, he is the son of God. He is the sacrifice of God to pay our sin debt by shedding his blood on Calvary. He rose from the dead three days later. And according to the scripture, he gives everlasting life to all that put their faith and trust in him. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But how many in hell cry out, if I'd only known that salvation was just in trusting Jesus, I would have gotten saved. You know, I think there's probably multitudes in hell that are saying this, if I'd only known that I didn't have another day, I would have gotten saved. Now, you might be thinking, well, preacher, they got you there because nobody knows when they're going to die. But the wisdom of God warned us about that. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, he says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. In James chapter 4 and verse 14, he declares, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. He tells us in Proverbs 29, 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. You see, there's a reason why God says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. God wants you to be saved today. He doesn't, listen, if you've not been born again, he does not want you to leave this church without getting your eternity settled in Jesus Christ. What a shame, what a shame to die and go to a sinner's hell with no escape when today you could have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Why would a person leave lost when such a wonderful gift is being offered to you today? How many cry in hell if I'd only known? If I'd only known hell was going to be like this, I'd have gotten saved. If I'd only known the salvation was just in trusting Jesus, I would have gotten saved. If I'd only known that I didn't have another day, I would have gotten saved. But it'll be because they rejected the wisdom of God and said yes to the wisdom of man. But you remember, I said there are three groups of people who will cry if I'd only known. My second group of people are those Christians who contemplate sin and do not realize its terrible effects. Let me just share with you the wisdom of God. 
Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 7, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Get this. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You understand that you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You sow wrong, you reap wrong. That's reality. Christian, that's reality for you as well. Hey, King David didn't get away with it. Here's a man who was a man after God's own heart. Here was a man that God exalted to be king. And yet at a time when kings went forth to battle, he didn't go forth to battle. And he ended up committing that terrible sin of immorality with Bathsheba and then had her husband put to death. He was king. Guess what? He reaped what he sowed. We find that the enemies of God blaspheme God. Then he had the death of that baby that came from that union, the rape of his daughter by his own son Absalom, and then the murder of one of his sons by another son, and then on top of that, the rebellion of Absalom that ran him off the throne, the openly shaming of David by that son, and then, of course, you've got the death of Absalom. And in that story where Absalom is murdered, leading a rebellion against his father, when David got word, we find him at the gates of the city as his army is returning from the battle. He's got his head in his hands, and he's crying, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I had died for thee. And every time I read it, I think, David, you didn't have to die for that boy to keep him alive. All you had to do was keep uh, Bathsheba from your bedroom, and that boy would still be alive today. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. There's a preacher, been dead now for a number of years. His name is R.G. Lee. I have never heard a preacher able to paint pictures with words like that man. I had the privilege of interviewing him when I was a young preacher, and I asked him where he got such an amazing vocabulary. He said every day he would sit down with a dictionary, and he would go through until he found a word he didn't know the meaning of. He would write it down, write down its definition, and then use that word in several different sentences until he had it down well. This man could paint wonderful pictures. His most famous message was Payday Someday. He preached that message over 1,200 times. I heard him preach it. I believe the number was 1,061st time. I heard him preach that message, and I said spellbound. It was absolutely amazing. He pastored the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, where Adrian Rogers later pastored that church. Now, this man... He took a strong stand against a number of things. One of the things he was against was alcohol. And he would preach hard against alcohol. As a matter of fact, he was preaching for a friend of mine. This is many, many years ago. And uh, he was uh, preaching for a friend of mine and bringing a great message. And suddenly, in the middle of his message, now you got to understand, this is an old southern gentleman. He is everything you would think that a southern gentleman would look like. He stood very erect, very proper when he spoke. And he was bringing a great message and suddenly he blurted out, I hate liquor. Now, that's liquor for you Yankees. That's alcohol, okay? And he said again, I hate liquor. I hate liquor. He said, if I had one hair on my head, even as much as I need hair, but if I had one hair on my head that I thought wanted to drink a liquor, I'd pluck it out and I'd stomp it. I hate liquor. And then he went on and preached the rest of his message. He got all done. After the service, the preacher went up to him and said, Dr. Lee, what on earth got you started on alcohol? He said, while I was preaching, I looked down about the third row here on my left. I saw a man licking his lips like he wanted to drink a liquor. And I wanted him to know whose side I was on. <laughs> Dr. Lee had a man in his church that thought it was all right to take a drink once in a while as long as you did it in moderation. 
For some reason, there are a lot of people who are so deceived that they think sin is okay if you don't do it big time. Just do it a little at a time. This man, as a matter of fact, would keep a bottle of alcohol up in his cupboard in his kitchen. And he would tell Dr. Lee, he said, I only use it, I only use it for special occasions like for an anniversary or something like that. And he said, I don't see anything wrong with doing something like that. And Dr. Lee said, well, it's just wrong. You shouldn't do it. Remember, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He and his wife had a little girl that grew up and uh, it came her graduation night. And she asked her daddy, she said, listen, when graduation's over, would, would you mind if, if I took the car and uh, took a couple of my friends and we went out and just rode around together? We probably won't be seeing one another for a long time with us going to different colleges and so on. And the man said, that'll be fine, hon. They had a great service there for the, the graduation. And boy, it was wonderful for the whole family. And the man and his wife went to the house. About 2 o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on the door. They got up, he went to the door, and standing at the door was a Tennessee State Trooper. He said, are you Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so? And he said, yes, yes, sir, we are. Do you have a daughter named? And he ran off the name and said, yes, that's, that's our daughter. He says, I hate to tell you this, but your daughter and some of her friends were in a car wreck tonight, and they were killed. And there was alcohol involved. They had been drinking. Well, the man, of course, was shattered. This was her only daughter, the light of their life. And they cried and held on to one another for a while. And then he began to get angry. Who in the world would have given my daughter alcohol? That would snuff out their light, right? Right as their very beginning of their life. Why would anybody do that? And he said, if I get my hands on them, I'd kill them. Well, the state trooper stayed around until the man settled down. And after the state trooper left, he told his wife to go on to bed. He needed a drink. So he went into the kitchen and he opened up the cupboard. And he reached up there for that bottle of alcohol. But instead of pulling down a bottle, he pulled down a note. It said, Dear Dad, this is a special occasion. I knew you'd understand. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's amazing to me. People think they can get on the internet and get into all kinds of pornography and wickedness and think because nobody knows, hey, God knows. And his promise is still true. You better listen to the wisdom of God. I said there were three groups of people who would cry, if I'd only known, the multitudes in hell would cry, if I'd only known. Multitudes of Christians who contemplate sin and don't realize its awful impact cry out, if I'd only known. But there's a third group, and that's those who are saved who will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and they didn't live for him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is the wisdom of God, beginning at verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give account for the things done in this body, whether they be good or bad. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, he tells us what's going to happen. He says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he have built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, though he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Now, the wisdom of man says a lot of things, but I want you to listen to the wisdom of God so, Christian, you don't waste your life. The wisdom of man says, take care of yourself. The wisdom of God says, deny yourself. The wisdom of man says, you got to feed your family first. Wisdom of God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The wisdom of man says, don't be a fanatic. But the wisdom of God says, I'd rather you were hot or cold, and because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. The wisdom of man says, don't turn people off by witnessing to them. But the wisdom of God says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I've heard people say, well, I, I don't want to turn them off. After all, uh, they're my friends, and maybe if I'm just happy around them, they'll come and ask me, wait a second. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
But I don't want to scare them. Where are you going to scare them to? Hell two, hell three, hell four. They're already going to hell. Maybe a lot of lost people don't realize how important it is because Christians act like it's not that important. The wisdom of man says, what's missing one service? The wisdom of God says it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Wisdom of man says you got to have some fun. Wisdom of God says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yes, I believe multitudes will say it in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, if I'd only known, but they're without excuse. Christians who don't know how to be faithful to the house of God, they don't get involved in reaching others and ministering to others in the work of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and realize then, too late, that they had wasted their life on things of the world. In the scripture, I see two men, very famous men, who came to the end of their life. One man... There's a man by the name of Solomon. He's in his throne room, and he's about to die. He's an old man. His story is told for us in the book of Ecclesiastes. I'd like you to turn there. The book of Ecclesiastes. And I want you to notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Remember, he's an old man. He's about to die. Now, this man obviously knew God. And you'll notice, for instance, beginning in verse 3, he, giving his testimony about how he spent his life, he said, I sought in mine own heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see that which was good for the sons of men, which they should do unto the heaven all the days of the life. Now notice his testimony. He says, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I planted me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and peculiar treasure of the kings of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers. I mean everything was for him in verse 9, so I was great and increased in goods. Verse 10, and whatsoever mine eyes desired... I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. Now you look at Solomon sitting on his throne. You say, man, that guy had a successful life, didn't he? Well, there's another man who is not in a castle. He's in a prison. His name is Paul. And his life is summed up for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want you to notice as he goes through how he spent his life living for the Lord Jesus Christ, he says in verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, saved one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often. Two men who knew God, one in a prison cell, the other one on a throne. This man did everything for himself, this man live for Jesus Christ. The one thing they have in common is they're both old. They're about to meet God. And back in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, this man sitting on his, in his castle, he says in verse 11, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity, and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Do you hear that man? As he's basically saying, as he looked on all the things that he had done, he's saying, I have wasted my life. What about this man? Sitting in prison. 
did without, suffered, beatings, thrown in jail many times. He says, <laughs> I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. You know what a lot of our problems is? It's wrapped up in this. We want to live like Solomon and die like Paul, and it doesn't work that way. How many Christians at the judgment seat of Christ are going to be saying, I have wasted my life? I got news for you. It is not the person that dies with the most toys wins. As someone said, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. If I'd only known. But we have the Word of God. We have the wisdom of God right here. We have the truth. Jesus said to the Father, thy word is truth. This is God's wisdom. If you're here today and you've never taken Christ as Savior, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you want to go to heaven, accept the wisdom of God today. Come to Jesus Christ. Receive his free gift of eternal life. Christian, you've been thinking about sin, contemplating sin, getting into things, or maybe you've started to get into things you know you shouldn't be getting into. Get right today, because the longer you're in it, the more you're going to reap. And it'd be a shame to cry out at the loss of a child, for instance, or a family. Oh, if I'd only known. Christian, what about using your life to serve Jesus Christ? Don't wait to the judgment seat to only say, if I'd only known. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, deal with hearts today, I pray. You know every individual here. You know where they're at. You know what's going on in their heart, in their life. Now, Father, I pray you'd save the lost today. And I know any loss that will come to you, you'll save. I pray there'd be people come to Jesus today and receive that free gift of eternal life. I pray, Heavenly Father, for Christians with sin in their life that they come and get things right now before it goes any farther. Pray they do it. Christians that need to perhaps rededicate their life to start living for you completely. God, have your way in every life, I plead in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes are closed.